Um, we're going to continue in our series on these attributes of God as we've been looking at all this year, and we still have about uh, four more weeks of this, uh, looking at the attributes of God. But we are sort of winding it down. Today we're going to be looking at a metaphor, actually, a metaphor of God that is um, not an actual attribute of God, but tells us a lot about who God is. And uh, he does, and, it, and you know, the Word of God does so in this extended metaphor. Um, actually, this is one of the, the metaphors that is used throughout Scripture. Uh, literally all of the genres of all of the different books of the Bible have this metaphor in them for God. And we're looking at this metaphor of him being our great shepherd. So today we're going to be looking at Ezekiel chapter 34. And if you look at that chapter, it's pretty long. We're not going to read it all at once. We're just going to, we're going to take little bits and pieces of it and kind of dissect those things. Uh, so let's look at, at starting at verse 11. We'll be working through verse 13 initially, and then we'll kind of jump around uh, within this chapter in Ezekiel chapter 34. Uh, three weeks in a row, we went to Ezekiel. That's got to be a record. Don't worry, we won't go there next week. I'm just saying now. So, uh, verse 11. For, for thus says the Lord God, Behold, I, I myself, will search for my sheep and will seek them out. As a shepherd seeks out his flock when he is among his sheep that have been scattered, so will I seek out my sheep, and I will rescue them from all places where they have been scattered on a day of clouds and thick darkness." And I will bring them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries and will bring them into their own land. So that's our message from the word of the Lord this morning. Let me start off by saying a sheep is a stupid animal. They are. They're dumb. Sheep lose their direction continually. Cats, dogs, other animals do not. My horses know the way home. They know when they've been pointed towards home. And if you don't hold on tight, they will take you there quickly. It's well known that sheep can't even find their way back to a sheepfold when it's in sight. In addition, sheep are stubborn creatures. When you find a lost sheep, it is very difficult to round them up and to bring them home. A lost sheep will scramble around and avoid you at all costs and won't go anywhere that you want it to. However, once you have found a lost sheep, you have to grab it. You must grab it. You must throw it down. You must tie it up. You must throw it over your shoulder. You must carry it back because it's not coming back with you any other way. Finding a lost sheep is really not difficult. It's getting them home that's difficult. Add to that that sheep are filthy animals. They are subject to the most nasty parasites. And so as a result, they have to be regularly thrown into a bath of strong chemicals in order to rid them of lice, ticks, worms, and other maladies. It's called sheep dip. You ever wondered what that was? They're foolish creatures. They can't tell the difference between a safe place and a dangerous place. Sheep will literally walk off a cliff. Sheep will eat unsafe things. They are the exact image of helplessness and complete foolishness. Behold, the largest metaphor for humanity in the Bible. You thought this was a good thing. The Bible says human beings are sheep. Independently, we bleat and run because we don't know who to trust. Sheep will always stay with the flock. Did you know that? Sheep immediately run to wherever there's another sheep. It does not matter if that sheep is in complete and absolute abject terror. They will run to that sheep and join them in their abject terror. I read this article a few years ago, uh, saw this, I thought it was great. Out of Istanbul comes this article. Hundreds of sheep followed their leader off a cliff in eastern Turkey, plunging to their deaths this week while shepherds looked on in dismay. 400 sheep fell 15 meters to their deaths in a ravine in Van province near Iran, but broke the fall of another 1,100 animals who survived, newspaper reporters said yesterday. 
Shepherds, shepherds from a Kisler village neglected the flock while eating breakfast, leaving the sheep to roam free. Did you catch that? This is a flock of 1,500 sheep. And the only reason that all of them didn't die is that some of them had their fall broken by the first 400. <laughs> if we are sheep, God is telling us that even together we are not going to be able to discern right from wrong. And we see that regularly. Without good godly leadership, we will never end up in a safe, comfortable place. We will never be well-fed. We're incapable of doing it on our own. Now, we can, you, you can try to bring all of humanity together, and that seems to be the world order at this point, is trying to bring all of humanity together, trying to decide things by consensus, what is right and wrong. But that won't work. Because we will never go where we should. In fact, we will flee from it, even if it leads to our death. Sheep never, ever, ever take a long view. They're incapable of taking a long view. A sheep, when left in a pasture, will eat that pasture completely down to the dirt and then starve to death in that pasture, even if there's no fences. This is a sheep. So all of this is background for why God provides leadership for humanity. Now, if you don't understand the background of why we need leadership in government, then you will misunderstand and you will fail to understand what the purpose of that leadership in government is. Humans are like sheep. That's our first point today. Like sheep, humanity will always do the short-term thinking, and we do. What benefits me in the moment, that's what I want. Whatever I want, I want it now. Oh, sure, you and I, maybe in our business proceedings, maybe even for our homes, we might create some sort of five-year plan or something like that, but psh, really, five years? I mean, that's just basically a slightly larger pasture that we can eat down to nothing. This is what Isaiah says. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. So this is why we need shepherding. Spiritually, we run from what is good for us. We consume things that are bad for us. And we wonder why we're always afraid. Humanity, in a nutshell. It's a spiritual problem. It's a spiritual malady. But the physical and social imagery applies very well to us as well. We needlessly pursue activities that bring disease and sickness into our lives. And I am not being metaphorical. Or did you think that STDs would happen in holy sexuality? Of course not. We continually put our hope and our desires in the wrong things. We rarely recognize truth even when it's confronting us. We can't find our way to God even when he is in clear view. So we are, forgive me, spiritually stupid, helpless beasts. So we need a shepherd. We do, absolutely. But we need to understand that every metaphor in the Bible is limited. So we don't want to take this too hard and fast. Every metaphor in Scripture is, limited, is a limited metaphor. So while we are listed as sheep, while God is referred to as a shepherd, it's a limitation within that metaphor that we have to recognize. Right? God is a shepherd, but he's also your father. We are sheep, but we are also his children. So don't hold too tightly to that metaphor and create a whole worldview out of that metaphor. The danger of taking that sheep metaphor too far would be that we could extrapolate it to say things that it was never intended to say. For instance, since we are sheep and sheep are stupid and never able to make a decision for themselves, then we need somebody to control every facet of their life. That would be a dictatorship, right? So we would not want that sort of thing for ourselves in our society. We don't want to go too far and too fast with that. We are, we, we aren't, let me, let me rephrase that. We aren't really sheep. We're like sheep. We have sheep-like 
attitudes. We have sheep-like characteristics. However, having said that, the sheep metaphor has a lot to say about how we live our lives, and we recognize that. For instance, we hate the idea of putting ourselves under the authority of someone else. I think that's a universal truth for North American Christians and North Americans in general. We just hate the fact that somebody might have authority over us. We rebel even over our boss at work. If it looks like anyone is trying to move us in a certain direction, we resist because, well, just because. That's how we are. Only I can decide what is right and wrong for me, or to put it in some of our society's vernacular, my body, my choice. Ooh, this escalated fast. Here's the thing. If we are sheep, then we need to let the shepherd speak. We have to listen to what God is saying to our lives and in our lives. And at some point, we have to allow him to speak. Like he says in Isaiah 30, this is the way, walk in it. When you turn to the right or when you turn to the left. If you don't allow yourself to be shepherded at some point, you're never ever going to find your way home. You're just going to be a little sheep corpse. So God has instituted human shepherds for us. He's done this actually for us. We rebel against authority, but authority comes from God and is implanted in certain human institutions for our benefits. Now, we need to rewind if we're going to look at this. We need to look at the first 10 verses of Ezekiel. Of course, we started with verse 11. The first 10 verses of Ezekiel 34 give us the actual problem, and the problem is not that we are sheep. The problem is actually our shepherds. They're the problem. Ezekiel was written during the exile of Judah into Babylon, and so we see in the first 10 verses, God is indicating the leaders of Israel, the shepherds of Israel, both the political and religious leaders have placed themselves ahead of the interests of their sheep, of those that are placed under their care by God. And so now they are bad shepherds. God's sheep, because of their being bad shepherds, God's sheep are now scattered. You see, God's partial but ultimately inadequate solution for our sheepiness is human leaders, human shepherds, but it's partial and ultimately inadequate. Why? Because the shepherds themselves are, by nature, sheep. So God has established three main shepherding institutions, but none of the three by themselves will accomplish everything, and none of the three, even together, will accomplish all that God wants because they're headed up by sheep. If you go to Romans 13, God says that, it says in Romans 13 that God has created the state, right? Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. So God has established government authority to be shepherds so that we can have order and not chaos because God is a God of order and not chaos. That's our government's purpose is to provide a place in which we can lead peaceful and orderly lives. The imagery of the shepherd king then is one of benevolent order for all of the sheep. The leaders are to lead the sheep for the safety of of the sheep. That is the primary responsibility of the government. The government then decides, well, <laughs> that's one of our responsibilities and we'll just take some more. See, sheep just tend to be sheep. For the development of the sheep, God established the family. Genesis 2:24 shows that the family was the basic structure by which we are to be ordered in our lives. Husbands and wives and children together. And then in the Ten Commandments, he says, look, this is so important to me. I'm going to make it one of my ten rules. Honor your father and your mother that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. So the the first shepherds that any of us have are those people who had, had complete control over you when you were the most helpless right? Those are your first shepherds. Their job is to nurture you, to direct you, to give you the basic foundation so that you can flourish and thrive in life. 
And some of you are saying, hmm, not so much in my case. Why? Because the shepherds are sheep still. You see, it's, it's his plan, but in terms of the overall permanent picture, it's an inadequate one. And then we see in 1 Timothy 5, we see the language of authority being drawn into the establishment of the church. He says, Paul says to Timothy, let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor. We don't have to talk about the rest of that. That word rule might be, you know, it might be better translated lead or manage, but nonetheless, the idea is set. There's an orderly way in which churches are supposed to be set up. There are those that are to establish the rules for the church. God establishes the church and its leadership precisely for the spiritual feeding, for the spiritual nourishment of his sheep. Just to give you an extra example, why do we call the face of leadership, good or bad, a pastor? Well, pastor is Latin for shepherd. So God has established these three institutions, the government, the family, and the church. Three structures to provide for, to care for, and to protect his sheep. And yet you know your experience tells you that in this fallen world, there are always crises of leadership. And that's what we see in Ezekiel 34. The shepherds of Israel, both the political ones and the religious ones, utterly failed. In verse 2, at the heart of what it makes, uh, uh, of, what it make, uh, of what makes, let me get my words to slow down. The heart of what makes a leader a bad leader, it shows us in verse 2, is self-interest. Thus says the Lord God, Ah, shepherds of Israel who have been feeding yourselves, should not shepherds feed the sheep? You see, instead of caring for the flock, the leaders, whether they were political or whether they were religious, used their position to set themselves up, to make themselves more comfortable. They're selfish. The desire to be served is at the heart of a bad leader. And from that bad motivation then flows two equal and opposite expressions of bad leadership that we see in verse 4. The weak you have not strengthened, the sick you have not healed, the injured you have not bound up, the strayed you have not brought back, the lost you have not sought, and with force and harshness you have ruled them. So on the one hand, you have this expression of neglect, right? You haven't done the things that you were supposed to do for my sheep. You haven't cared for them. You haven't found them. You haven't bound up their wounds. You haven't fed them. You fed yourself instead. And on the opposite side of this spectrum, you have this issue of abuse, this expression of abuse. You have ruled them harshly and brutally. So instead of being about the least of these and serving them, you have decided even if they're incapable of doing things that sheep need to be able to do, you're going to force them to do those things for you, for your benefit. You've decided that their purpose is to work for you. So what's the essence of a leader? A leader is someone who does a couple of things. One, they show people reality. You know, sheep don't often recognize reality. We talked about the fact that they can be within sight of the sheepfold and they won't go there. They're continually looking to their own self-interest. Hey, my belly needs to be filled even though I just filled it. Let me do it again. And so they imagine threats everywhere. You're trying to get me away from this pasture, which is going to feed me, and you must be evil then. But a good leader says, look, this is the reality. This is what we have to do. That's where we have to go. We have to leave this field because it's almost grazed out completely and it's almost out of food. And we have to go to that field over there because there's fresh food over there. I know you don't see it, but that's where we have to go. Or we have to go to the sheepfold, even though there's no food there because there's no pasture left in the sheepfold because that's the nature of sheepfolds because the sheep just eat it all up, right? We have to go there because there are wolves out here and they want to eat you. That's leading in reality. That's truth that needs to be spoken in people's lives. The other thing that a leader is supposed to do is love. 
Why? Because the leader's job is to ensure that as many sheep as possible get back to that sheepfold. So that as many as possible reach the goal without being trampled or lost in the pursuit of the goal. And the only way you do that is if you love your sheep. The example of bad shepherds throughout Scripture is that they don't love their sheep. They look to their own interests, and as soon as danger rears its head, they're out of there. John chapter 10. So this is, this is what a good shepherd does. He loves his sheep, and he goes out, and he looks for the one that was lost. He takes the initiative, and he brings them back. So this is what a good leader does. They lead in truth, and they lead in love. A good leader does both. But if the motivation of a leader is bad, if the motivation is all about their own self-interest, then you have either abuse or neglect. That's what we see here in Ezekiel 34. You either have abdication of their responsibilities. Eh, it's just too hard. They'll figure it out. Or you have brutality. Why didn't you do what I said, you bad sheep, and you kick them into next week? That's what verse 4 says. And so we see in verse 10 then, God says this, thus says the Lord God, behold, I am against the shepherds and I will require my sheep at their hand. I will rescue my sheep from their mouths. God's going to step in and he's going to change this sheepy leadership. Okay, but that's fifth century BC Israel, right? I mean, what, what could we say about our shepherds today? That's a loaded question, isn't it? Everybody automatically went, well, I don't see much difference, quite honestly. Look, everybody has always had complaints about leadership, right? Because we're all sheep, number one. So we're going to complain no matter what. Number two, our shepherds are sheep, and they're going to fail. So it makes us poor evaluators of good leadership. However, I have to say that if I look at our society in the last 50 years, including world politics, there have been so many scandals in government, so many scandals in business, so many scandals in the private and public sector. There have been scandals in churches and denominations. We don't have to list them off. You know what they are. You've been watching the news. So would you say that our leaders are More like the leadership that God lays out that they should be like, or more like the leadership we see in Ezekiel 34? Probably more like the second one, right? So I think we're having a crisis of leadership today. And if we allow that crisis of leadership to continue, where will we end up? What will our exile be? I don't know. The sheep are saying, look... Every time I look at you leaders, whatever you leaders are, whether it's secular or private or religious or political, whatever it may be, you're always looking out for your own interests. You're always making yourself fat at the expense of everybody else. Why is that? You're abusing your privileges or you're leading in conflicting directions. One institution says one way and another institution says the exact opposite. So here's the thing. What do we do? Look, if we're placing our hope in the next generation of human leaders, we're always going to be disappointed. Always. Every time. Because by and large, sheep make terrible shepherds. By and large. Now, there's good examples. Every now and then we get surprised, right? And we get a good leader. But in general, all human leadership is is another sheep that came in looking for his own self-interests. And so as a result, they are not the final solution, praise God. So what is the ultimate answer to our sheepiness? And of course, the ultimate answer is God. God is the ultimate shepherd. Our ultimate hope isn't in human shepherds. We have someone greater. So this is what we read when we started off in verses 11 and 12. He says, this is what's going to happen. For thus says the Lord God, behold, I, I myself will search for my sheep and will seek them out. As a shepherd seeks out his flock when he is among his sheep that have been scattered, so will I seek out my sheep and I will rescue them. Remember we said that a sheep, that a shepherd leads in love. Look at the, the, the example that God gives us here of his love. God shows us this is how he's going to solve our problem. 
And, and really, when you think about it, that the, the, the God that is exalted, the, the, the picture of God that you have of Isaiah chapter 6 is this wonderful, powerful place that Isaiah feels like he can't even be in the presence of. He says, no, I'm going to rescue all of my sheep. I'm going to do the work. But you don't just find this idea in Ezekiel. It's also in Jeremiah and it's in Isaiah. Because of the failure of human leadership, Isaiah says this, Behold, the Lord God comes with might and his arm rules for him. Behold, his reward is with him and his recompense before him. He will tend his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms. He will carry them in his bosom and gently lead those that are with young. Do you see that? I mean, he's coming in might, right? His arm rules for him. <laughs> and that might make the sheep fearful, right? When you see that and you see this great big shepherd striding for you, he's got this stick in his hands. He's like, ah, oh, he's going to whack me. I just know it. And that's why you run. But look at verse 11. Unlike the human shepherds of the first 10 verses of Ezekiel 34, he won't be harsh. He comes in truth. That's the right arm, right? But he'll rule with compassion and tenderness. He gathers his sheep to his bosom. It's all about the tenderness. It's all about the love that he exudes. His arm rules, but his arm also cradles. Hmm. God is showing us what great leadership looks like. Look at verse 20. Therefore, thus says the Lord God to them, Behold, I, I myself will judge between the fat sheep and the lean sheep, because you push with side and shoulder and thrust at all the weak with your horns till you have scattered them abroad. I will rescue my flock, and I will judge between sheep and sheep. You see, God is inserting himself because some sheep have styled themselves as shepherds and have styled and have, and have trampled on the weaker sheep and have pushed them away from the good food sources and have said, no, 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 it's about me first. And they've fattened themselves at the expense of others. And God says, no, 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 that's not just. Justice is coming. I'm going to judge who the good sheep are. And we see then ultimately his plan in verse 23. And I will set up over them one shepherd, my servant David, and he shall feed them. He shall feed them and be their shepherd. Now, if you, if you don't understand how scripture is laid out, you read Ezekiel and you say, okay, he's going to set up David. So this must all be happening before the Davidic kingdom, right? This, this all happens before David becomes king. No, 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 no. David died 380 years before this was written. So how is it that David is going to be the king that he's going to set up? And, 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 and after all, didn't God say he was going to do this? Why is he setting up another person then to be in charge of all of this? I don't, this is confusing. And the answer is that God uses David as a typological example of what the shepherd king will look like. Typology is something that's used regularly within Hebrew poetry. He says, this, look, David was a shepherd. We, we all know that from the stories of David, right? He was a shepherd boy that became a great warrior and eventually the king. He was a shepherd king. So what this is saying is that there's going to be one like that that's going to come. A man after my own heart, in fact, he will be part of the Trinity and he will be descended from David, typologically like David, but superior in every way. And so that one is set up as a type like him. And that's why in John 10, when Jesus stands up and he says to everybody that's in that crowd, he says, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He's not saying I am a good shepherd. He says, I am the good shepherd. What Jesus said is he's claiming Ezekiel 34. He's claiming Ezekiel 34, 23. He's claiming to be the ultimate one, the shepherd king in the line of David. He's saying, I'm the shepherd who came to solve all of your leadership issues. 
And I will do all of these things. Verse 14 of Ezekiel 34. I will feed them with good pasture. There they shall lie down in good grazing land. And on rich pasture they shall feed. I will seek the lost, and I will bring back the strayed, and I will bind up the injured, and I will strengthen the weak and the fat and the strong, I will destroy. See, this is the ultimate solution that God has provided for the problem of our sheepiness. It's not a word. First Peter says about us sheep, for you were straying like sheep but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your, of your souls. You see, he's pulling that statement out of Isaiah 53. We all like sheep have gone astray. But praise be to God that he is the great shepherd and he calls us back. He has found us and he has brought us back. That doesn't make us great. We're still sheep. Look at what he says. Look at the ways that he says he shepherds. For the lamb... In the midst of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will guide them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And look at the richness of that passage there in Revelation. It is a wonder to me. I spent a lot of time and thought on this this week. I mean, is it, this is an amazing passage. There's a lamb. We know the lamb, right? Jesus is the lamb of God. He's the one who was sacrificed on behalf of us so that we might have life, so that our sin would be atoned for. He is resurrected. We celebrated that two weeks ago. And now he's in the midst of the throne because, as Philippians 2 says, at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. So the lamb is at the center of the throne and he is the shepherd as well. There's too many metaphors. I can't can't wrap, wrap my mind around this. The lamb is the shepherd. He's the shepherd king. That's what it means for him to be in the center of that throne. And he leads perfectly. He leads sheep to life, to springs of living water. Throughout his teachings in the New Testament, Jesus is constantly talking about living water. All the struggles and trials are going to be over. That's what's indicated by the fact that God wipes away the tears. He's the ultimate servant. He has the ultimate servant heart of a shepherd. So he is the shepherd, John 10, who became the lamb, John 19, that's the chapter describing his crucifixion, who is on the throne, Revelation chapter 7. This is the shepherd king, praise God. Jesus says, no other shepherd can call you out but me. No parent can do that for you. No minister can do that for you. No one can do that for you. Only I can and I have. I went to the cross and all the things that should have happened to you fell on me. All the punishment, all the justice that should have come down on you, all the tragedy, all the sin that you brought to the game has come down on me. <laughs> I'm the great shepherd because I lay my life down for the sheep. There is no one who you can trust like Jesus because no one, no other leader ever in the history of the world, nor ever will there be one, who can lead like Jesus. He's the great shepherd for a couple of reasons. One, he has the ultimate servant heart. Two, he has the ultimate servant shepherd skill. <laughs> he and he alone leads in truth and love. We talked about that being the two aspects of leadership that have to be held hand in hand. This is the message of the cross. The cross says there's a way that's right, right? There is a way that's right. The justice must be served. Failure must be dealt with. This is what the cross tells us. But the cross also says there is a God who loves and deals with it by taking it on himself. There's a mess that has to be dealt with. That's the truth. And there's a God who wants to hold you close. That's the love. Because he loves you and he knows the truth about you. There's nothing about you that's hidden from him. He knows you better than you know yourself, infinitely better than you know yourself. You will never come close to the knowledge that he has of you, ever. No matter how long you spend in eternity, he will know you better than you know yourself. If you let him lead you, you'll experience the good that only he can bring to you. He says, I'm the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. 
So he knows the truth about you. He knows his own. And he calls you out of the mess that you get yourself into. You think, well, there's no way he could forgive me. Yes, he does. All the time. Forgive. He leads you to living water. He wants to lead you to living water. So here's the question. Are you going to let him? You got to come before him. You got to say, I'm releasing this. I'm repenting of this. I'm not going to live under my own strength anymore. I'm not going to be my own shepherd. I'm going to let you shepherd me. He leads you then to the living water. He wipes away the tears. Why would you look anywhere else? To quote Peter, where, where else would we go to get the words of life? If Jesus is the good shepherd, if that's true, and it is, this is a radical critique for us for every single kind of leadership that we experience in this world. Every culture that we have of leadership needs to be critiqued based on this. Because if Jesus is the ultimate shepherd, then what he's done is he has relativized every other form of leadership. He is your authority. If any other authority works against what he has said, their authority must be held secondary to his authority. He's the shepherd king. However, if he is your authority, you can't live your life any way you want to. You have to die to that life. This is what it is to take up your cross and follow him. You have to bend your will to his immediately. Carrying a cross isn't a trial, it's death. You have to pick up your cross and follow him. So if he says that you shouldn't look lustfully at someone else, you have to take that seriously. And all of the things that come downstream from that, that's just one thing. That's probably the easiest thing for us to pick out, sexual sin. He has the right to speak into that because he's your shepherd. If he's your shepherd, then you need to be where he's shepherding. That's part of the obedience. You need to be in a group of people that recognize he's the shepherd. Don't go running off to a flock that's going to run off a cliff. You need to be where he's shepherding. Your physical presence needs to be with his sheep. Not exclusively because you got to go call people in. you got to help him shepherd. He gives you that privilege. But you need to be where other believers are fellowshipping together, where the word of God is being preached with grace and truth, where the ordinances of God are being given. You cannot get ordinances online. Sorry, YouTube watchers. You need church. And not just any church. It needs to be a Bible-preaching, community-practicing group of believers who want to be together and fellowship with each other and encourage each other in their faith. Not just come and hear a sermon and leave and check off a a, a checklist and say, I'll see you next week. That isn't enough. Get into the community and serve it. Let the other sheep know you and you know them as you follow the shepherd through his word. Through the sound of his voice, which is the word of God. And then don't deny your sheepiness. <laughs> you, you need to find a group of sheep who are placing themselves under the ultimate authority of the shepherd king. That means giving up lifestyles. It means checking your attitudes, all of those kinds of things. And then you just have to learn to trust Jesus as your shepherd. I think a lot of you believe in Jesus, but maybe not trust him as the shepherd. Listen, I have horses, right? And I know this to be true. If I were to let them free, they'd survive just fine. There are wild horses all over our country. Came to be wild through a variety of experiences. Without a rancher, cattle and horses do just fine. But without a shepherd, sheep die. So you need to trust him completely, not just for your forgiveness. You you need him so much more than you think. If I can say that, I'm going to be bold with that. Don't just go to Jesus when you're in trouble. You shouldn't just be praying when it's convenient. 
You need to be looking to him in all aspects of your life. All areas of your life should be open to him, not just when it's convenient for you, consulting with him, relying on him, because he's your shepherd and he knows what's best for you. If you don't do that, all you did was elect yourself part-time shepherd. And we saw what happens in Turkey when shepherds take time off. Sheep tend to run off cliffs. Very often, sheep feel like the shepherd is dangerous. I get that. You may looking, be looking at God and going, I don't know if I want to get that close to God. He seems kind of dangerous to me. He might tell me things that I don't want to do. Remember what we talked about with sheep when they're lost, what you have to do? You, you may find them, but you got to get them back to the sheepfold somehow. And God occasionally has to throw you down and tie you up. And you say, this is the worst thing that's ever happened to me. Why are you letting me, why are you doing this to me, God? I blame you. You don't know what's going on. Right now, it's possible that you're experiencing some rough handling in your life. And you may be going, I don't understand what God's doing in my life right now. I thought he was a good shepherd. Yeah, exactly. You don't know what's going on. You don't know what his purpose is and all of that. But you do get to trust him because he tells you he's the good shepherd. Look, 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 look. <laughs> Life is going to be a disaster for all of us if we try to lead our own way. If we all try to go our own way, it's going to be a disaster. There's one way. We get the opportunity to call Jesus the great shepherd of our soul. Because at the cross, we see perfect truth and perfect grace, selfless truth and selfless grace. So we can lean into him. We can le lean in and depend on him, not just as a guy up there, some bearded guy on a throne. We can trust him as a shepherd. He has the words of life, and we can rely on him for everything. I'm going to call up our worship team as we close in prayer this morning. We also need to go get our kids, too, and have them come back in. Why don't you stand with me as we close in prayer this morning, as we, as we uh, wrap this up. I feel like maybe this was a little bit negative. I didn't intend it to be. I just want to encourage you to lean into your shepherd. That's really what I want, because he's great. He's got all the wisdom we need. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that we would trust you more every day. And I know at times we're wrestling with you for control of our own lives. Lord, I pray that we would yield. I pray that we would give that up. I pray that we would be able to say, I died to myself. And therefore, it is no longer I that live, but Christ in me. May we be able to say that with boldness and clarity to a world that desperately needs to know you, that needs to see you and find you as their shepherd that they can experience the relief of knowing they don't have to be in control of everything, that they can give up to you, and that you'll lead them well. Lord, may we trust you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.